All right, so I'm here in Cairo, Egypt, and uh, I'm visiting a mushroom farm. They are growing oyster mushrooms, like a white oyster mushroom. And this is a little bit more of a, a warm weather strain because of the hot summers. And it, this farm is very like closed loop. They're trying to farm off of what they're producing. So one of the things they use is their own, uh, the silk farm waste. They'll take the, the, the berries that they feed the, the silk worms and the stems will get ground down. And I'll show you that process in a minute. Um, and that's what they use when they have it. If not, they'll use straw right now. They're using rice straw. Um, so these are incubating. And it's just regular bags with a knot on the, or it looks like they use a string on the top. They poke some holes for air ex exchange and then it goes over to fruiting. This is also the same room that they grow the silkworms in. So you see these funny looking trays here with the screens that they're not using for the mushrooms. The reason why is this is what the silkworms grow on. And then the poles, they put them in just for converting it to oyster mushrooms in the wintertime when they're not silk farming. And then over here is the fruiting side. So you can see they're getting, I'd probably say about a pound per block. What do they get, a half a kilo per block of mushrooms? Yeah. And then for misting, they're simply using some low pressure nozzles. How many how many kilos are they getting per, per block harvest? It's a four and a half kilo block, yeah. which he expects to harvest not less than one kilo. So yeah, it's 25%. Okay, that's pretty good on straw, yeah. And here, this looks like the, the first flush on, on some blocks that are just coming in. And then, uh, you know, the, the floor is always wet, so that helps with humidity, and they, they do have some circulation fans moving the air around. And then they have just big greenhouse fans over here, getting rid of all that CO2 buildup. <laughs> Okay, so he's showing us how he has the humidification set up. So it's all off of a timer. There's a just a dial timer, and then they're they're uh, is that 12 volt or 120 volt or 240 volt? 240 volt little pumps with a little filter, little particle filter, so that the nozzles don't get clogged up. And then it looks ju just like quarter inch supply line going to a half inch, and then that. So it's probably only pushing what 40 or 50 psi because th those fittings don't hold up very well. Do you know, do you know how many, how much pressure it is? How many? Uh, was it kilo bars or whatever? Six bars. Six bars. That's a lot. Six times. Yeah, 12 times six. 12 point or 14.7. That's a lot of pressure. But he's all, he also has a lot of heads on it, so the pump might be rated for that much, but he might not be pushing it. These look a lot like like elm, elm A, or like white, uh, was it white pearl or, right? Hey, for us, the color of the mushroom makes more of a difference, more than a, more, yeah. more than the flavor for that matter. So the, the whiter they are, the more yeah. we consider them better mushrooms. So it doesn't okay. really matter how they taste, what they're going to do with them because you're probably going to chop them up anyway but if they're white then they look like the european ones yeah like, like the common mushroom so the market likes that so blue oysters wouldn't do really well in, a, in this market because the color is not as appealing blue, blue is scary blue is scary yeah blue really is scary. okay wow. like maybe if you have something like a darker creamier white that yeah. would be okay Lightish gray, that would be okay, but if anything like has full body color in it, yeah, that would just be scary. It's just a phobia of like being being toxic Poisonous or something. Or something. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, All right. Interesting. That's a great cluster right there. So as you can see, it's not the most fine mist, but a lot of the particles are making it to the ground. So that's also getting evaporative cooling off of the ground, evaporative humidification off the ground. 
and almost none of it is actually making it onto the mushrooms. Very little of it, only the, the slight bit of really fine drifting particles will make it onto the mushrooms. So it's not soaking the mushrooms at all. And these are very similar to what I used to use when I did straw. They're like the DIG products, D-I-G, uh, makes, makes nozzles like that. And then what this is, that is an anti-drip. It might be actually a, a no, I think it's an anti-drip. It might be a speed, or a flow controller too. But um, typically that's a, a valve that when the pressure stops, it'll hold uh, the pressure in the lines. So that way this thing isn't just dripping the whole time that it's off and draining all of your supply lines. It's just a little check valve that needs a couple pounds of pressure to open up and then when it loses the supply pressure, it'll seal off the valve and that'll stop the calcification from building up on the nozzle because what happens is if you have constant dripping, as it's dripping, it's also evaporating and then you're going to have just calcium building up on that nozzle and you're going to have a lot more maintenance. Okay, so here's where they do the shredding. This is a shredder that they have. And they're using, what are these, just gra like wild grasses. Rice straw. Rice straw, okay. Mm. And the uh, bark of the uh, trees. The, okay. The so they're growing, they're growing berries out there and the berry trees, um, those are what they're producing silkworms with, right? Is that how it's working? And the the, um, the waste of that, the, the stems of that every year, they use that primarily when the season is right to shred it down and make make the mushroom blocks. But um, when that's not in season, when they don't have that available, then they'll go ahead and import in straw, either uh, wheat or rice straw, right? And and they'll grow off of that. Um, and then this is the shredder they have. So what is it? It's a little rotary shredder. It has a little wheel in there that spins around. There you go. Okay, and it just yes. chops it. And it's ran off of a little, like five horsepower brakes and Stratton look into a four stroke engine. Chain drive or belt drive? It's like a belt drive. You got a belt on there, real simple. Real simple design. So, carbureted. Looks like they have it in a burlap sack. They're gonna boil it, okay. What? <laughs> so they are sterilizing this, not pasteurizing. They are actually sterilizing the straw. during yeah. the entire year, so he would start with doing worms during no. summer when it's warm, so he doesn't need to warm it up for them. Okay. And then during winter, he uses the mushrooms, so he doesn't have to pay for air conditioning because, well, no okay. So rather than air conditioning down and paying all that money, well, they don't even, they don't even have air conditioning here, do they? No. In, on this facility. No, no. They'll just use the insulative properties, whatever they have, and, and uh, let it get a little bit warmer for the silkworms, but I guess they like that, that warmer environment. Exactly. Yeah. And then in the winter, at night it gets cold, cold, okay. cold like yeah. 6 degrees or something like this. Okay. So he has that buffer of cold, yeah, yes. just go into the concrete and then over okay. the day it will warm up with the sun, but yes. then that's why they have the, have the insulation for the sun. Okay, cool. How, how warm can the, the silkworms handle? What's the highest temperature they can handle? So, 25 Celsius. Okay. Yeah. So still have to, 80 is rather humid. Stay kind of cool. Right now. It's, still, it's still cool. Okay. And, and with the mushrooms, you couldn't do that because you'd be sucking out all the hot, the cold yeah. air. That's your, yeah. 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 Y
So this is their processing. They are taking the clusters and breaking them down into individual petals uh, using a, a little shear. So he'll, he'll uh, cut it with the, the shear and they pack them and they saran wrap them. And what is a half kilo or? No, that's a half a pound. Half a pound, okay. Yeah, I'm going to the Yeah, okay. And they get sold at, at local markets, or where do they go? Okay. Almost everything. Home delivery, they sell to restaurants, they sell to the our equivalent of a farmer's market. Okay, cool, cool. Is that your little business card with yes. your little label? Yes, uh, welcome to the phone. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. 10 Egyptian pounds per 200 grams, or how much is it? Per 100 grams? It's about the camp. A kilo bit bab 50. فالطبق ده يتباع مثلا ب 12 ل 15 15 15 جي بي 90 سنتس 90 سنتس فور ا ليتل وان باكيت فور وان باكيت اوكي والتيكت ده استاذ خالد احنا عاملين له خاص بالرابطه بتاعتنا عشان خاطر الاستاذ سامح بيعرف راي الناس بعد ما بتاكل المشروب عجبك ولا ايه المشكله اللي قابلت حضرتك في الاكل في وصفات معينه لو انت مش عارف انا بقول لك عليها خلطات معينه عشان خاطر يطور المنتج بتاعه ويتكبر So, so the number he's adding to, or the business card is at, he's adding is is one of the managers for the farm. Okay. It's to get to gather feedback on taste and or help someone who doesn't know how to cook it or what kind of recipes they can use. Okay. Ready for the market? Yes. Market is a home of all the time. The ticket is written on the time of the day, Mr. Sazna. The time is 10 hours, like we were going to the machine. And it will be 10 hours. It will be 10 hours, but it will be 10 hours. And it will be 10 hours. And it will be 10 hours. But we are going to write the name of the... No, it's not. It's not. It's not. اكتر حاجه طازه يعني او يفضل طازه وبعد كده هيبقى أيوة. اقل فيبقى الاختيار للمستخدم بس انا حاطين له الاختيار الانسب ليه يعني. They write the day's date and mm -hmm. that piece of paper says that it has a 10 day shelf life. Okay. They say it can go longer than 10 days but it's best before 10 days. 10 days to make people yeah. have it when it's still fresh. Yeah, I think past two weeks they kind of fall apart. They get all, they start growing out again. They get the mycelium growing out of the stems. Not so pretty looking anymore. And why do they do them uh, gills up rather than uh, gills down? I want to leave it rosso el khashin le fouk mish le ta'at. Ashan shakla agmal wada al afdal le. It makes it look more beautiful. Okay. So that makes it better for marketing. Gotcha. Okay. I'm going to look at the nazar of the nazar. He's saying that this is kind of local to our market. They like it like this. Uh, If it's face up, that's what they, when they expect like a common button mushroom. Okay. Okay. The other way around, you're saying the face down. Okay. 
this shows that it's an oyster mushroom. It shows the gills are white yeah. rather than black. Or gray. Or, or, or gray. Or, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, thank you. So, one thing I wanted to add is that they were, I was talking, they were asking me what are what, some value added products. And, um, they were, I mentioned that they can make dehydrated mushroom powder and they can add that into salts or just sell it as a product itself. So right now they're throwing this out. They're, they're, we're not throwing it out, but they're feeding it to animals. Um, whereas that's, that's a couple pounds of stems there. And one of the things I recommend is they can look into dehydrating them, powdering them, adding them to salts with seasoning, adding them to just packets of, of dehydrated mushroom powder or mushroom jerky. And, uh, so they're going to give that a shot, see if they can do that as well or, play with the idea so so here are the fields with the berries and uh they're berry trees that are kept down to a bush and that is what they'll use to feed the silkworms from what i understand and then when they trim them back the stems are, are what they use for the the mushrooms they're also interplanting some garlic he has some onions over there some fava beans um, fava beans are very, culturally in, in the Egyptian culture, they use it for a uh, fool, which is their like uh, bean stew. And that's, it's a big part of their meal, part of their, uh, what their intake is, you know. So very integrated farm, zero waste, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, product getting turned into other composts and, and feeding other parts. And then also... A big part of this is he's he's a model farm. He considers himself a model farm to where he's trying to sell the idea and sell the concept. So he sells the the worms. He sells the cuttings of this. And that's what I, a lot of these greenhouses on the right there are. It's about 150 feet of just propagating. Just propagating out the um, those the berry the berry trees and then he sells them to other farms. And he also sells the worms to other farms. So any of his excess becomes product. And here you can see all the cuttings. So he has these in, in plastic bags, little plastic potter bags. And then he also sells them bare root over here where he just plants them in sandy soil. And then he'll strip off the, the dirt and sell them bare root a little bit cheaper but easier to produce like this. So I'm back in my hotel room now. Uh, did a little bit of, of research. I couldn't put my name on the type of tree. So it's a mulberry plant and they are basically coppicing it or coppicing it where they're cutting it down to the roots almost every year. Um, and that's what's in the field you saw in that last part. And then from there, they'll take the branches with the leaves on it. It's not so much the berries, but it's the leaves. So they'll take a branch with all the leaves on it, probably some berries too, but they'll take that and lay it in bundles on those trays, the ones with the burlap bottoms, the screen bottoms. And then they order little eggs of a caterpillar and that they'll eat through all the greenery. And then after all the greenery is eaten, uh, the little fat caterpillars will build their little cocoons and they spin out their own silk and they do all of that on site too. They'll they have a little kind of loom thing that unstrands the, the cocoon. Um, a whole nother side of the operation is the vermicompost. And I didn't cover that in this video because there's a whole nother video I have to edit for that. It's probably going to be just as long as well. They have about, it's got to be an acre maybe, almost an acre, a half acre probably at least, of vermicomposting. And this is super low tech. And uh, they're using all of the waste of the operation and then also bringing in some manures as well. And they're making high quality organic compost for, for local uh, farmers or gardeners in the area. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you like this video. Um, some other stuff on my side, some updates is I have classes now available on MyersMushrooms.com. For the summertime, I'm only doing two classes this year. Um, it was a little bit too much for me to handle with every month, so I kind of backed off the classes. Um, Bag sales are, are kicking butt, so if you need bags, hit up MyersMushrooms.com. Uh, if you like this video and you want to see more content like that, support me through Patreon.com. 
I don't have, um, or even Amazon affiliates, I don't have the, my YouTube is not monetized. So if, uh, if you like watching my videos, please contribute even a dollar there a month or a dollar there a video, whatever, however much you can, you can spare. So yeah, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. Keep on mushrooming. Have a good one.